family. Thank you so much for being here today. Today I'm going to talk to you about how to write a literary analysis paper, including some topic ideas for literary analysis papers for both American and British slash English lit, and also some generalized topics you can apply to any great book that of your choice. So today we're mostly talking about novels, different application if you're going to write literary analysis about plays and poetry. So I can do that in another video, but today we're talking about great books. So if you are a lit student, if you are in an undergraduate or graduate program, then, or even high school, maybe, this might be great and helpful to you. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what a literary analysis paper is. Okay, so let's get started. If you're new here, Please subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any future videos talking about great books, uh, reviewing great books, giving you writing ideas for homework for great books, and more. Okay, so let's get started. So first we're going to talk about some general um, topic ideas that you can apply to any book. So let's say you're in a class, you have to write a literary analysis paper about any book of your choice or any books that were included in in that lit syllabi curriculum, I'm gonna give you some topic ideas that you could almost always spin from any book. So I will get more to what a literary analysis paper is at the end when I give you my tips for writing. Okay, so the first is a character analysis. You can do a character analysis with almost any, any piece of great or classic literature not that hard. It doesn't matter if you're reading Plato or if you're reading any of the Bronte sisters or if you're reading Dickens or if you're reading uh, Harper Lee or Ray Bradbury. It does not matter. A character analysis, you can pick your character from your book and do a character analysis. analysis. So ideally you want to pick a character that you feel is the most influential to the work. Maybe the most um, there's a mo the most controversy around that character or the character that has the most contribution to the overall theme of the work. So it doesn't have to always be a primary character. It can be a protagonist. It can be an antagonist. It can be a secondary character. It can be a very small background character who was inserted to be symbolic of an overall meaning that you only see glimpses of that pops up through the book. And you can discuss the purpose of that character popping up in the book. A character analysis generally starts with a character dossier. So you'd want to write down everything about the character for your own notes, um, who the character is, age, family status, race, religion, economic status, uh, personality quirks, um, personality faults, um, big, big problems of the character, small problems of the character. Then I always encourage to write a timeline of character development from where the character is at the beginning and where the character is at the end of the book. So you can show how that character evolved, namely naming the character's um, roadblock or obstacle or problem, um, generally, which is where a character starts in a book and outlining how the character develops, grows, evolves, overcomes strife or struggles, um, overcomes his conflict within himself, conflict with nature, conflict with another character. And you can talk about how that evolution of the character in the work somehow um, influenced the, the plot or the storyline or why even did the author write this character in that way? That is the most important point of your character analysis. Not, we don't want a, a, just a bio, you know, we want to know, you, we want you to analyze this character. And the best way I can think of to do that is if you've ever been in a relationship with a, a man or a woman, ex-spouse, where that person was always doing something janky and sketchy or mysterious, or you were always kind of, you know, trying to figure out that behavior, you might have really been in there analyzing their actions, their um, little behaviors that they thought were covert, that you, that were not covert, um, how their behavior set off your intuition, the little things you saw symbolically around the house or in the personal belongings or in, in uh, electronics or social media or phones that indicated something else was going on and, and how that set off your intuition and why your intuition came to certain hypotheses or conclusions and analyzing behaviors, analyzing why is my partner doing this? What is really going on? 
developing your hypotheses, then trying to get evidence to support that character's behavior. So it's not that different when you're analyzing the heck out of somebody you know, but more you are tying it into the purpose of the work that you are reading. So that would be a general character analysis you can do with almost any book. Okay, the next, I have a book here. Well, I'll get to that one in a minute. So my next is the portrayal of women in whatever work you're reading. That would be my next generalized topic idea. I assume it's not a 100% male novel, right? So there's going to be women in the book. They could be primary characters. They could be secondary characters. They could be background fluff. They could be card paper, cardboard cutouts just for show. They could be significant. They could be insignificant. And generally, the women in the book in most classic works that are meant to look insignificant have a very significant meaning behind their insertion into that work. So you might want to look at women, who, oh, whatever work you are wanting to write um, about choosing a character, you might want to do a general paper on how women are portrayed in the book, um, uh, you know, as compared to the men or um, just in society, it depends on the time period you're writing the book, the roles women have in that story, the roles, roles women had in the time period that the book was written. You might want to cho choose a single character or set of characters, female in the book and how they contributed to the controversy in the work or how they contributed to the plot and the outcome or how they influenced the male characters or how they influence change. For example, Henry James in many of his novels, Portrait of a Lady, uh, The Bostonians, The Ambassadors, um, you, well, actually took that one back off. But anyway, the point is, he writes generally about feminism and women coming to independence and power in a time where women were supposed to be in their fluff and parasols and petticoats and um, being pretty and knitting and reading and hosting and entertaining. And for example, Portrait of a Lady, we have the character, um, who, the main character who comes into some wealth and wants to travel, does not want a husband, does not want a man. Everybody is against it. Everybody pushes her into it. She's kind of an outcast. She becomes, in, she becomes wealthy through inheritance. And there's all this talk from other characters about can she handle her money? Will she even know what to do with her money? Because she's a woman. So we can look at, you know, women's independence in a time when women were not meant to be independent. Um, you can write about women in social classes, like you see in Henry James's The Bostonians. You can write about women if you want to do some earlier, earlier, far earlier literature, Renaissance literature, or medieval literature. You can write about women, how they're portrayed in books like The Canterbury Tales. You can write about women uh, and, and those time periods, how they were, you know, basically abused. <laughs> women had it really hard in history. If you look at certain periods in history, women were not treated that well. So wherever you see women inserted in whatever novel you are reading in time period, you can tie the role of that woman or those women in that book into a topic and relate it to the history of the time and the author's purpose of how women were portrayed in any great work you read. There likely will be some female characters. Okay. That would be my number two generalized topic. My number three, according to my list, is the use of imagery in any novel. I mean, literary devices. If you're studying literature, you understand what literary devices are. I can do another video about that. Literary devices are, you know, skills and techniques and tools that the author uses to um, build the world and, and hint at deeper meaning. And it's very complex and I don't want to do that in this video. But symbolism and imagery are incredibly important to the meaning of any work. And a, a skilled um, author is going to use imagery. So you can do um, you can do a paper on how imagery is used. Imagery would be the setting um the landscapes uh the uh the visual descriptive descriptive writing of you know the social circles of the banquet halls the tea rooms the ballrooms how setting uh influences the the scene or drives the plot imagery of what what the reader will see from the descriptive writing of the author and how that's used for story building and world building. Imagery is very important. If you think of a book such as, uh, or uh, say a fairy tale, Hans Christian Andersen, maybe the Snow Queen or 
um, the uh, Little Mermaid, something like that. So, for example, in the Snow Queen, we have this just dazzling, beguiling, sparkling, mesmerizing visual descriptions or descriptions meant to induce a visual of this snowy, magical, frigid, just, you can just see like the little rainbow fairy dust sparkles on the snow and the trees and on the bushes and, and how um, inside versus outside. So these amazing descriptions of things inserted to build um, a, an aura, you know, of the frigid and the cold and the dark and how that, the imagery of those things gives that feeling, which also portrays something bad to come. So imagery, it doesn't matter what kind of imagery it is. It could be, um, I mean, every author uses imagery different, but if you just do a little research on imagery and, and, and imagery and how it's used, um, even in modern day fiction, there's imagery put in there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very common theme. So it's how imagery is used to build a character, how imagery is used to, um, to show history in the work, how imagery is used to, um, f with foreshadowing to build suspense in a suspense drama, like in one of Agatha Christie's books, for example, how imagery is used to make the readers feel certain emotions. So it's extremely easy to take that topic and almost go anywhere with imagery, with almost any novel. I've done it hundreds of times. I mean, honestly, I've seen it in my students with grading English papers. I've done it myself in my undergrad and my graduate school. It is probably one of the easiest things. Now, you have to have read the entire book to mark in your books where imagery is used to do this. You cannot write a paper about imagery uh, now analyzing a book if you have not read it because you will not know all the scenes where imagery is used. So, you know, Cliff Notes is just not going to cut it. All right. Number four on my list of general ideas for any genre is, okay, you can do a comparative analysis of any two novels in the same genre or in the same time period, um, different genres. Um, so, for example, you can compare, um, and you can do a paper on Victorian era, um, Victorian social class, and you can compare a Dickens novel to, you know, something in Jane Eyre, to a Bronte novel. Uh, you can compare George Orwell with Ray Bradbury. You can pick two different books that are about social injustice, maybe like To Kill a Mockingbird and Beloved or, you know, something. And you can compare comparative analysis, analyzing how, why are you tying these two books together? So let's say they're written, they're, one is a gothic novel and one is maybe... A satire. Well, you're comparing them. So why? What is the common theme? What are the common messages of the story? What is the co common symbolism? What is the common uh, similar similarity in characters? Um, similar writing styles. Um, you know, maybe you want to compare Kate Chopin, The Awakening, to uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which were both you know women writers on the Yellow Wallpaper and how writing about women's suppression, women's unhappiness, women's depression. So it's really pretty simple. You just have to figure out, um, the comparative analysis is going to work better with smaller works because if you're going to compare a mega bruiser of a novel like Tom Jones with a mega bruiser of a novel, War and Peace by Tolstoy, first of all, not only do you have to figure out what they have in common, what you're comparing and why, you have to have read those bruiser novels before you can do that. So um, likely if you're in a class, pick two books in the class and do a comparative analysis and try to narrow your comparative analysis down to something major, like a theme that you see in both. And then when you're doing that, you want to cite evidence of where you see that in each book. Um, you want to talk about how the author uses that theme to build the the work and how the other author uses that same theme to build the work. Narrow it in tightly. You're not reviewing the book. You're not talking about everything in the book. You're just narrowing down to one theme or one symbol or one idea or one concept that you might see a parallel of similarity in both books and write your paper on that. Done that many times. A little more scrutiny needed, more note taking, but very doable and really gives you plenty to write about. 
Okay, so the last one on my general ideas for any book or genre is you can write an essay on social injustice or societal roles in any novel. Social injustice is probably everywhere in every book, especially, um, I mean, if you're looking at modern day fiction, social injustice could, I mean, racism is everywhere. It doesn't have to just be racism. It could be how women are treated, as we already discussed, as a social injustice. It could be how children are neglected. It could be about children in the workhouses and, and bleak house or hard times or david copperfield and that social injustice is using children as slaves uh, it could be social injustice again with uh, racism if you're writing any if you're going to comment on any uh, literature write a paper on anything from the, the 60s you know during the time of uh, martin luther king or if you're going to um sort of do the, talk about the social injustice and of immigration in a, bu a book that was about immigration from some classic work um and the unfairness of of how people are treated when they come to America. This you might see more prevalent in Asian classic literature. Um, we see that in the Joy Luck Club and a lot of other Amy Tan novels or similar. Um, maybe you want to write about um, social roles. So even some of the books I already discussed, such as, and I started with The Portrait of a Lady before with Henry James. And um, in this book, the character Isabel, she inherits, the, she's an um, American, she travels to Europe, she comes to some extended family there, she inherits some money from an uncle, she, everyone's trying to push her to have a husband, it's not pro appropriate to have all this money and not a husband, and she says, heck with that, I'm going to be independent, I don't want a husband, I'm going to travel, I want to see Italy, and yada yada, and you know, she's, she's judged, she's bullied, she's prejudiced against, she eventually falls into the trap of marriage with a narcissist, who is um who kind of squanders some of her money and on and on you can talk about social injustice with uh women who attempt to be independent um uh, and and free and go against societal norms so you can tie the topic of social injustice with expected societal norms and when you don't follow expected societal norms you now are experiencing injustice. So there's social injustice of any kind. There's there's gender, socioeconomic, there's religion, there's LGBTQ. So you can just take that anywhere. But yeah, so um, social injustice and how it plays into social roles and expectations in almost any book. I mean, you know, social injustice even in relationships between a married couple when one person is being treated poorly you can find something in almost any great classic work where there's some kind of social injustice going on i mean i don't think i've ever read many books where i don't see that even in the futuristic novels or the sci-fi novels so so really i think you have plenty to go with here those are five general ideas for any book or genre you can use um, for an essay for literary analysis. Now let's get into my ideas for American literature novels. I have five ideas with some five specific books with some topics you can use that I brainstormed for you. One of my favorites, The Great Gatsby, 1925, F. Scott Fitzgerald. So you can write about the role of wealth in The Great Gatsby. You can write about how um, the moral lesson or uh, is the great Gatsby a cautionary tale? What is the lesson? What is the cautionary tale? How is wealth used and portrayed um, in the great Gatsby? And how, and you can even tie that into the concept of an essay about the American dream, use great Gatsby as an example, the, the achieving wealth, achieving riches, lavish, opulent, you know, just lifestyle where anything goes and how it can all be lost in the flash of a second and how um how is wealth shown about how it's something Americans are to strive for and the message and meaning it gives and what does that mean to the people who can't achieve it and can't reach it and how they're like there's a lower class and there's a class differentiation between lower middle and upper class and great Gatsby it's all about the wealth and you can see some overlay ties there into the um the other classes so great example if you want to write either about an American the American dream or about um a very classic well-known American novel and not very long so easy to do easy to read great spinoffs of any essay topic regarding wealth um with the great Gatsby my next idea was um we talked about Harper Lee, Killing Mockingbird. I had Race and Injustice in, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, 1960. That was written, obviously, racism, prejudice, 
I mean, I mean, I think it was the PBS special and they published a book that came up with the 100 greatest books ever written from, according to their viewers' polls. To Kill a Mockingbird was number one and it's because of the hardcore and important um, and not to mention genius writing of the portrayal of social and racial injustice, primarily racial, into Killing Mockingbird. Can't go wrong there. If you're a high school student in particular, I mean, it's all over the book. It's like smathered everywhere. Like you just, <laughs> prejudice is all over the place in there. So um, different kinds as well. So generally, um, that's a very common one. So if you're looking for something a little outside the box, maybe you want to go to um, Mark Twain, write about uh, Tom Sawyer or the Mitchell Huckleberry Femme and the uh, racial injustice in there and, and which we see with... Um, and that's a very diff difficult book to read. A lot of people don't like it. The dialect is hard to understand. But I tell you that by the third to fourth time that I, I read it, it was like that. As you get older and you've you've dived into more literature and understood more dialects and read these things, it's no longer difficult. So that's another option. Okay, next we have on my list... The Role of Friendship in Moby Dick. Now, Moby Dick is another bruiser novel, but the role of friendship is prominent uh, in Moby Dick. You know, obviously, it's a nautical novel. But when you think of nautical, you think of, um, you know, something like Treasure Island, for example. You know that everybody on the ship are crew. You know, they're like family. They are usually the men that ends up that end up on these ships don't have family. That's why they're there because that is their life. That is their love. That is their passion is to be on the ocean and be explorers. So friendship is extremely an extremely important um, as a theme in Moby Dick. If you look at the character relationships, if you get in there and you look at um, some of the particular um, scenes, for example, uh, how dialogue is used to show friendship, how friends having each other's back or, you know, shipmates having each other's back and the trust and the rapport developed and how that was influential to the, the book and the work. And there's a lot of more touching, I, I thought there's a lot of touching um, uh, scenes and, and quotes in there relating to certain characters amongst the friendship as well. So why do you think that Herman Melville wrote it in that way. Why was there such emphasis on um, male relationships and friendships in that book? And how does that relate to the seafaring life and um, the outcome of the book and the catharsis that the main character has um, toward the end? So that would be a great one as well. If you've read Moby Dick, if you don't have time to read Moby Dick, then don't bother. But if you have a passion project, and Moby Dick is a great one. Um, there are some scenes that are going to be feel like pulling teeth to get through, but it's totally worth it. All right. Next I have, uh, is that five? Oh, yeah. The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Uh, if you've never read The Sound and the Fury, be prepared to feel pain. Um, if you have and you hated it, give it another shot because it becomes painless over time. Um, Sound and the Fury, William Faulkner. The use of how four different perspectives in that novel as a literary device or writing style helped the reader to understand. Again, brutal, not brutal novel. But if you re if you've read it or studied it, there are four different perspectives used in that book um, as the story unfolded that helped to bring the pieces together. So if you were to imagine that book was written with only one perspective, one character's point of view or even two, how much harder would it have been to understand? Would it have changed the whole entire uh, evolution of the story? Would it have changed the plot or the outcome? Why is multiple point of view or perspective important in his type of Falconer's writing style? Um, you can write about what would have happened if, you know, if he hadn't done that, what was the purpose it served, how do readers view differently the work when there are different perspectives and why four, not three, not two, not one. So that, it, it, you know, and as you're reading um, uh, Faulkner, you're going to need to annotate your book and mark what you think, you know, where perspectives shift and think what, write down what you think of, of why it's shifting at that time. And what would have happened if it hadn't shifted? How would that change things? So you have to do some deep thinking 
with um, Sound and the Fury, but completely worth it. And you can't be a literary scholar without having read some Falconer. Okay, so my last four American literature novels is, as I briefly touched on with The Great Gatsby, is The American Dream. So The American Dream in almost any classic American novel. So you can think of, um, of Mice and Men. We've got, of course, The Great Gatsby, some Hemingway. We have um, The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, um, Arthur, Arthur Miller. The Bell Jar, um, the American Dream is touched on because she ends up, uh, you know, per wanting per to pursue this free <coughs> freedom in American life and ends up in a menstrual institution and her rights are taken away. She has a blockade to that American Dream and it, she suffers the plight that many Americans do. So you can take that essay topic of the, per the, the, you know, the theme of the American Dream, the pursuit of the American Dream, the longing for the American Dream, um, you can, you know, do My Antoinette or O Pioneers. I mean, you can take many, many great American novels and see how the American dream ties into that. And what does that work say about the American dream? Is it supporting it? Is it mocking it? Is it giving you lessons on how to achieve it? Is it creating social inequality through the message of the book by saying, if you don't have it, you're scum. If you do have it, you're great. So what are the messages of the American dream? How is the American dream used in that novel? So you can do that with probably many, many classic uh, American uh, literature novels. I don't have a particular one, just those few I gave you. Um, Steinbeck is a great start. The Grapes of Wrath, another great one. Absolutely perfect for that. Okay, now I have English novel essay ideas. So I have five and... Um, one of my favorite, most of them are general, one of them's favorite. So we can talk about uh, the theme of adultery. <laughs> so one of my favorite books, The Scarlet Letter. Another one of my favorite books is Lady Chatterley's Lover. So you can do an essay on the theme of adultery in Scarlet Letter, Madame Bovary, um, many others. <laughs> so, but those are just two of my favorites. Um, how is adultery, per, how does adultery connect to the time period of when the book was uh written how is adultery portrayed um you can do a character analysis in relation to the adultery um in one of those books like hester prynne for example um you can talk about how adultery um it you can do a comparative analysis between those two books how adultery is portrayed you can do anything with the theme of adult adultery you know um how did a, a, a modern society view this novel how it showed adultery at the time it was written and, and how did that influence change the scarlet letter is commonly known as one of the most well-known banned books uh, at the time period it was written and many times since then so i am in the process of developing a very intensive literature course that will be available to everyone on the banned uh, classics throughout history with an extensive reading list and study list and lectures and scarlet letter is on that list um so i but that is a great essay topic and it, it gives you a lot to write about and you can even narrow that down to any any aspect of the adultery that you want to take off on in your essay okay so we have suicide and society madame bovary so um or i mean you can pick the concept of suicide or depression um, from any um, novel where that is shown it tends to show more with women than men in classic works but Madame Bovary you could do character analysis of the character um, you know how the potions and the meds I believe Anna Karenina touches on that as well so you can talk about uh, how society might have viewed that topic during the time how, how this work influenced society you could talk about how um uh, the, the book was uh, developed and how the book used symbolism and imagery and theme to hint up to this event um, through a writing structure analysis. There's a lot you can do with that. But again, another one of my favorite books um, with strong female characters that aren't always as strong as they seem. Um, you can write about Gothic landscapes in Weathering Heights. One of my favorite Bronte novels, The Gothic Landscapes. Obviously, it's a gothic novel, but write how the landscape as one of the major themes and or uh, traits of a gothic novel is always the landscape, how that builds the world. Um, my cat's trying to get up here. Builds the world, sets the tone, sets the pacing. Um, so, for example, in Weathering Heights, the gothic landscape is the cold, windy, 
dark, shadowy, wet, broody moors, the, all the out on the moors. So there's lots of scenes of walking across the moors and going across the moors. And how does the landscape, how is the landscape alive? The landscape itself is a character. How does the landscape as a character um, push the book along and influence the book? And you can compare it to what if that book had not been written in the Gothic style, but the story was the same. How would that have changed the outcome of the story? as well. So Gothic landscapes, you can apply that to many, um, any Gothic novel of your choice. You could do Jane Eyre. Um, you could do the Castle of Toronto. But anyway, Gothic landscapes um, as Gothic landscape as a character or living entity that moves the story forward. Okay, next we have... Do, 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 do. Um, okay, I talked about this a little bit. Portrait of a Lady, one of my favorite books. Um, the Wealthy Women in the portrait of a lady. There are multiple wealthy women. In fact, not only Isabel, who inherits the money, um, she's a very rich aunt. There is later in Europe, when she um, meets the artist who is kind of a jerk, who ends up being the one she gives up her independence for to marry. He has a sister who's a countess. And also he had like a lover who it was a, a an independent woman who mothered the, his child. We don't know who the mother is until, until somewhere later in the book. She's independently wealthy. And how women in Europe um, that were independently and or uh, inherently wealthy, how were they portrayed? How were they prejudiced in society? How were they viewed? How were they, uh, how was their plight in the novel? The plight of the wealthy woman. There's a great topic. The plight of the wealthy woman in Portrait of a Lady. Um, and then you can talk about several different wealthy women in there and how their journeys and stories change. Um, the struggles that they face and um, why this is significant to have been put in this book and or how it could have influenced uh, the world at the time when they read that book. Um, lastly, for my English novel, I have The Origin of the Christmas Tradition in A Christmas Carol because A Christmas Carol was my favorite book of all time. The Origin of the Christmas Tradition. And by the way, I keep talking about Portrait of a Lady. I just realized I had it sitting right here. So this is about how big this is. Um, this whole book is, I mean, I, I talked about multiple themes you can apply to this book. It's really great. It's a great book for social um, social essay topics. And of course, I was talking about Bronte, Weathering Heights. Not quite as big, not the easiest read, but this book is all about the dark landscape, uh, the gothic landscape as well. Okay, so we're talking about, yeah, the origin of Christmas tradition and Christmas Carol. So Charles Dickens' of Christmas Carol um, actually is known to be the the... Other than The Night Before Christmas by Clement Seymour, the primary literary work that influenced how we celebrate Christmas today, which, of course, stems from England. So starting with English and spreading outward. So the the way it's portrayed with the feasting, you know, with um, with Scrooge's nephew and um, the giant stuffed turkey and the plum pudding and the 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 fact that Christmas is a, less religious and more about merriment and joy and celebration and appreciation for life and all about good tidings and goodwill and donations like charitable gift giving at Christmas we do now with the St. Vincent Paul or the goodwill. A lot of that stems from especially how you know donations increase around the holidays and you start getting the pamphlets in the mail and the emails that's because of stems back to the christmas carol as as the beginning origins of how we celebrate christmas today as uh, showing you how literature can influence societal change that lasts decades or generations and this would be a perfect novel to write about that Okay, so let's get into some tips for literary analysis, your literary an analysis essay. So what is a literary analysis essay? It is not a book review. A literary analysis essay is not a book review. Do not write about what the book is about, okay? You are not a book blogger. You're not a booktuber. You're not an Amazon book reviewer. We do not want to know what the book is about. That is not what a literary analysis essay is. I've said that to my students hundreds of times and they just don't get it. It is not what the book is about. Remember that. Okay. Not what the novel is about. You are not a book reviewer. Uh, a literary analysis essay is about the who, what, where, why, and when. Sometimes just about the who's and the who with the what and the why. Or the when may not be relevant, but more about the who and the why or the what and the why. So you pick a theme, you pick a person, you pick a topic, and you get into explain why. Why? 
this was happening. Why this theme? Why these actions? Why was the character portrayed that way? You're going to explain it. A literary analysis paper is scientific more than it is a commentary or more than it is your opinion. And it's not about your opinion. You're analyzing something. Just like if you were a crime uh, journalist or if you were, um, you know, a, a forensic expert and you are analyzing the report of the evidence on the dead body. Like you're looking at the fact, you're trying to make connections, you're trying to explain reasons or why for this blood on this knife or that spot on that wall or whose hair was stuck on that key. You know, it's it's more breaking down to the nitty gritty. That's what a literary analysis is. And it's not analyzing everything. You're just breaking it down and you're honing in on one thing that influenced the work that is consistent throughout that is important enough to analyze. If it's not important enough to analyze, don't choose that as a topic or it'll, you'll struggle to finish your paper. You will not have enough to write about. Okay. So you're going to talk about why the work is significant. You're going to talk about how the work influenced the genre. You're going to maybe talk about how language is used in the book how the author used language, the narrative style, the points of view. Um, you're going to talk about the narrative voice as a, as a, a literary device. You're going to talk about um, how these things were meant to, to influence the outcome of the work. And then you're going to get into um, a particular topic or theme as I've given you some already. So I have a list of seven tips. The first is when you're going to write a literary analysis essay, read the book, read the book, <laughs> cliff notes, spark notes, internet. You cannot write a literary analysis paper by skimming, cheating, or reading the cliff notes because the teacher will know. Let me tell you guys, I have two master's degrees. I've taught college online. I've taught college in person. I'm also a writer. I've also been a tutor. I know the teacher always knows. If you want to write a literary analysis essay, you have to read the book. And not only do you have to read it, that leads to my number two tip. Well, actually, no, that actually blends with my number one tip. Read the book and annotate it. So let's say we're doing Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. You're going to write a topic. This is an American novel. This would be another great example for an American uh, literature essay, American Dream, and how books and literature and freedom of reading ties into that. Or you could write about uh, how books were showed as controversial and influential to society in this, just as they are in modern day. But... Let's say you're reading, you're going to do uh, this novel. What you want to be doing is you want to be annotating, writing little notes, circling things, underlining things. This is why you want a book you can write in. So when you're going to write your essay, you can tie in. So sometimes you don't know what your theme of your essay is going to be until you read it. You wouldn't have to try to think of one. It will come to you when you're reading, when you see recurring patterns and themes and parallels and um, messages and You'll know it, you'll see it, you'll feel it, you'll know what your options are to write about when you read. This is why you want to mark it. And you also might want to uh, make notes in a notebook or in like a bookly app about things you think of, quotes you like, or thoughts you have as you're reading if you can't fit it all in the, in the margins to help with your essay. So read the book, annotate it. That's the backbone of choosing your topic. Choose your topic. Ensure it's relevant not only to the assignment, to the book, and that it's important. Um, otherwise, don't bother. Your instructor will be bored. Um, number three, identify what conflicts arise within this topic. Okay, so the conflict in here, for example, in Fahrenheit 451 is books have been banned, sneaking and reading books. Um, and there's a lot behind this. But um, so in almost most novels or characters, you're going to see a conflict. It'll, it's going to be man against man. So two characters having a conflict, protagonist, antagonist, two antagonists. Battles, wars, fighting, hate, revenge, resentments. Um, you're going to have man against nature, man surviving in the wild, man uh, stranded, man battling gothic weather elements. Uh, um, you know, how the uh, nature is influencing what's happening to a person. Um, you might have man against his own mind. So the psychology against the human. So a man who's just seething with like hate and revenge and trauma or 
or PTSD or fear and how that's holding him back and how that influences the story. Um, so whatever the conflict is, so you need to you need to identify what the conflict is because the conflict is greatly going to help you when you're analyzing. The conflict is basically what underlies in the plot. Okay, and you can identify that when you've read the book. Number four, collect, te collect textual evidence and quotes to put into your essay, which is why you want to annotate your book while you're reading it. I always put um, a little star or and underline a few lines of quotes I really like that I might want to use in a book. Or I might do like a line to say this whole page or a line straight down in the margin. This whole page I want to use. Um, so quotes you like. And then eventually when you identify your theme, you can go back and pick some of the quotes you like. Yeah, because likely the theme you choose will be something that resonated with you based on similar to the quotes you liked. So then you can immediately jump to quotes that you want to use to support your points in your work. And you're going to use your quotes. For example, you're going to say you're going to be talking about something in your essay. Then you'll say, this is evidence by and then quote, put the quote in as evidence. Or you could say, um, we see this when the author writes and then put in quotes what it is and then continue to explain it or you know look for an, a reoccurring theme or a reoccurring issue in the book and that will be the best way to not only pull quotes but to choose your topic um okay my last few tips yeah connect your number five connect your topic to the quotes and the overall picture that the book portrays so whatever topic you choose find quotes that support it and prove it and and support your your topic um, and tie it into the overall theme of the book or the overall story or the overall plot. You don't want to tell us what the book's about, but you want to, you know, put in some commentary in your essay about the overall plot of the book and why your theme and this conflict or these quotes are relevant. Um, number six, notice any contradictions of themes or complex patterns. So wherever you see contradictions of two different themes or complex patterns, that's something you want to notate. Um, classic literature is full of, of just complex writing, complex thinking, complex concepts and ideas. These give you great backbones for a topic to write about. It also is shows you wherever there's complexity is where you want to look to pull things to write about or to pull quotes from. Okay, number seven, offer new directions of thought, um, something maybe not thought about before. So here's an example. When I was in doing my undergrad in literature, uh, probably early 2000s, I was doing some women in literature class and we were reading The Awakening by Kate Chopin and I had to do an essay. And at the end of Kate Chopin's The Awakening, and this is all about, her, you know, her, her views on marriage and escaping her role as the wife hosting the party and running off when it was going on. And at the end of the book, she's having, she, she gets, takes off her clothes. I don't know if she has her clothes on or off, but she gets out and she swims out to the middle of the ocean and looks back at the shoreline and where her life is. And she's, con she's having thoughts about meaning of life and, and the, her roles on, on life and women in, in, in society. And, and, and then the book ends. And I remember writing an essay. I mean, it's, it's presumed she committed suicide, which you can also tie into the Madame Bovary or Anna Karina and that, all, that stuff. But um, if you're doing comparative essay, but I remember writing an essay saying she didn't die. We don't have proof that she died. We don't know if she was killing herself. She could have just been a free spirit who, was wanting to connect with nature to contemplate like like absorbing the feeling of freedom like going out to this vast big ocean with no one to stop her on this freezing cold day and looking back at her life and realizing how, how humanity connects with nature and her small insignificant role in it and bl and contrasting that to the wide expanse of the vast ocean and she made some kind of conclusion for her life or how she wants things to be different. And she swam back. I think I wrote about that. And I remember my professor called me into his office after hours. And I remember specifically, this was what, like 20 years ago. I remember he said, uh, I think it's very interesting how you're in denial of the ending of the novel. And I thought it was fascinating. So I wanted to talk to you. And he had never had anybody deny an implied meaning 
It wasn't even specific. It didn't show or say she was killing herself at all. Because I read that last chapter and that last page 50 times to make sure. And I explained to him my other, you know, new idea, my new concept, another way, another way of interpretation. Professors like that. So if you can come up with a new direction of thought or a new way of viewing something that's against what many others say about this book, not only will that catch your teacher's eye, you can pull a lot from the book to support it. And I think you'll find it fun and challenging. I really enjoyed that. I just like to see my teacher squirm. I always thought that was great. All right. So I think we're at the end. Um, my final thought is you cannot write an essay or a piece of literary analysis of a book you have not read. You cannot fake it. Fake it till you make it does not apply when you're becoming a literary scholar or studying great literature. It just doesn't work. So you're cheating yourself. Do you really want to get a degree in English literature or a graduate degree in English literature and having skimmed half the books and really not know the work? That's not what it's all about, people. So if you're going to write a literary analysis paper, you better be reading. So if you have str if you struggle with getting through all the books you're assigned, if you're at uni, um, I can do a video about that and give you some tips if you'd like. Let me know in the comments below. Please like this video. It helps me get seen. Subscribe if you have a chance and tell me if any of this was helpful. I look forward to meeting you in another video. Oh, 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 oh,